We want to read from Isaiah 45, but I would like to remind you of some of the truths that were in the first Psalter number we sang from Psalm 135. Psalm 135 in verse 6 says this, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Then it continues, He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. And now it gets even more personal. Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. Just how he did that is also described in Isaiah 45. There we read, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, this is written before Cyrus was born, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. All describing how Cyrus was going to be a mighty conqueror, an emperor. Even though he would never knew God, Never feared him. He learned about him. Learned about him when this prophecy of Isaiah was told him. But again, he didn't have to be a believer in order for God to make the crooked paces straight before him. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine anointed, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I th am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour out righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his Maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work, who he hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee. In chains they shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Verily, thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior, 
they shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell me, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Ju Israel be justified and shall glory. May God bless the reading of his holy word. 5 and 6 and 7. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee though thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Lord's Day 10. Lord's Day 10. Remember, this is another part of the Articles of the Apostles' Creed presenting what is said we believe, what we must believe to be saved. In that first article, that's what's still being covered in Lord's Day 10, There is the word providence is not used. But this Lord's Day, which treats the whole subject of God's control over all things, is implied in the fact that he created. I, the Lord, created all things, the maker of heaven and earth. And the fathers say, if you can say he make, is the maker of heaven and earth, then you also have to say he's the controller of it. And if you would read Isaiah 45 again, then how many times he doesn't refer to himself as the maker, the creator. Those are two thoughts that go hand in hand. An article, a Lord's Day that, for some, is a favorite. I would guess that most would pick out Lord's Day 1 first, but it wouldn't take long before they would, in their list of favorites, come to Lord's Day 10, especially question and answer 28. What dost thou mean by the providence of God? The almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby as it were by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven and earth and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. What advantage is it to us to know that God created and by his providence doth still uphold all things? 
that we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which shall hereafter befall us, we place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father, that nothing shall separate us from his love, since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. In our treatment of the subject of providence, we desire to take uh, two times to treat this. <clears throat> Next Sunday, the Lord willing, we're going to focus on his providential control of our sufferings, looking particularly at that we suffer, why we have to suffer as a part of God's providential control of all things. Today we consider that subject. We're going to get into some sufferings, but we're going to want to take the big picture first. And that is that the Holy Spirit help us to understand what the Word of God says about God's control. His powerful and everywhere present control so that it is, as it were, his hand, his fingers, are watching and in control of everything that happens. So first we look at our Father's sovereign control. Our Father's sovereign control. And then secondly, our or his children's response. We're going to use the word providence. We're going to talk about providence. And just about every one of you has a very, very good idea about what providence is. But we're going to fail if the focus of our understanding is on providence when it should be on our Father. This God, this one only God, created everything. And everything that he created, he didn't let go of. But he still controls. That control is first that he never stops speaking the word that he spoke to create it. We build something and we walk away from it. We work on something and then we're hopefully finished. God never has stopped speaking. Each word that he specifically spoke to create something of his creation. Light. Just take that, that one. He still is issuing forth that same word that from our perspective and measurement he began 6,000 years ago. Every second and every millisecond of time since, he still is speaking that word, let there be light. Now, a week would say, let there be light, and then we'd forget about some other things. But God's speech is for everything that he created. And by that word that he speaks, he causes it to continue to exist. When he stops speaking it, that thing ceases to exist. Now think of our bodies when we die. The word that he spoke When a sperm and egg joined together and a life began, your life began, the life of any and every human, he hasn't stopped speaking that. The, though the body is dust, the soul in glory, 
He is still speaking those words that are necessary to uphold in existence that soul and that dust. Ashes, whatever it is. But then secondly, he not only upholds, but providence means that that awesome God is controlling it. Things are not just happening. They're guided. Even if it's so normal, so normal, that every time you take something and you let go of it, the law of gravity, we call it, is going to be the same. It's going to drop. But it's guided. Every part of it guided. Guided so that not just the hairs of our head, but nations and kings of nations. Look at Psalm 45, Isaiah 45 again. What he says, all the heathen will do as they tremble at the presence of, uh, of Cyrus. God is going to make them so speak that I will loose the loins of kings to open unto you their gates. They're going to be so scared of you, they're going to willingly surrender themselves to you. I go before you and make the crooked places straight. Kings of the earth are nothing to God. Think of how Nebuchadnezzar, when he recovered his mind in Daniel, Four spoke of God's sovereign control. Every part of creation, lightnings flash, we sang in 387, 373. All kinds of things, the roll and the sound of thunder, all under that control. Animals. Second Kings says very specifically, God brought lions into that land of Canaan when the inhabitants, later called Samaritans, were worshiping other gods. God brought the lion that killed that man of God out of Judah when he, when he stayed and ate in the house of that prophet in Israel. God closed the mouths of the lions when Daniel was in Captivity. God, clo God guides every mosquito that buzzes in your ear when you're trying to sleep. Every fly, every bee sting. He controls every one of his creatures. Satan and evil spirits all under his sovereign control. Pharaoh in Egypt. In anticipation of next week, every calamity and all the suffering that God's children experience. 1 Samuel 1, 5, he closes the womb. Ruth 1, verse 20, Naomi says, Call me bitter, because God hath brought this calamity to my life. Listen to the way it's said here in Isaiah 45. I form the light and create darkness. Now notice, there's creation again. I make peace, and I create... Now, the word evil is the idea of bad things, things that we call bad. I form the light, make peace, I control and bring about the evil. Tucked in the prophecy of Amos, chapter 3. 
Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have nothing at all? Shall the trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Amos 3, verse 6. He controls what we call the normal and the special, the pleasant and the unpleasant, the greatest is so beneath him and the tiniest. An alarm clock that doesn't work. The rain that goes around the soybean field when it needs it so badly. The lab report the advancement of age so we can't live in our familiar home anymore. A telephone call in the middle of the night. A car door that we slam on our own thumb. Or somebody else closes the tailgate on a finger. Or the news that a child yet in the womb is developing with a stomach in the wrong place. Or suddenly the daughter is born and missing half an arm. God, our Father, So that when we consider the truth of his control, there are certain adjectives that we must use in order to understand it. Constant. Constant control. Constant guiding. We don't use the word continual to describe God's control, we use the word continuous, because continual is dots, and dashes with gaps in between, but continuous is one solid, constant control. Constant control. Omnipotent control. Because you can't look at this Father and call Him just mighty God without understanding that to mean almighty. So that if you see power or might exercised by thunder or lightning, rain or the movement of an ant hauling something that's bigger than it from one spot to another, any control, any might exercised by any of the demons or Satan himself or all of the angels... Every bit of might has its source from him, gifted by him to a creature, and yet gifted so that he doesn't just give it, and then it's not his anymore, but theirs, but it's always his. Assyria is called his axe, the instrument he would use to punish Israel. Constant, almighty, or omnipotent, free. Free. By that we mean nothing 
can prevent him from doing what he wants to do. There is no outside force or event that makes God have to alter. He is sovereignly free in his control of all things. Everything is after the counsel of his own will. It's always something that he has planned in that perfect determination of everything that is going to be and must be. Everything is a part of his perfect ordination. Something that he's had for as long as he's been God. But now in time he's carrying it out. Working everything after the counsel of his own will. Another one, wisdom. Wisdom. The ability to be able to see the best way to the highest end. How can something be done and it's going to be done not just get the job done, taking the low road, taking whatever way you're going to get there. No, taking the absolute best way to accomplish the highest end for anything. Wisdom. And for you as children, love. He's, he's not just in a relationship with you that He loves you, and then other things pepper us. But the Father's control is so governed by His love of us that that love is behind anything and everything that happens our way. An economic downturn. This the kidnapping of a child, the murder of your wife, the words you heard somebody say about you. Everything. be able to see this control, this guidance, but not just to see that control, but to see the controller, to see the hand, to see, better yet, the heart that's behind the hand the heart that governs and controls that hand that controls everything, everything in your life. So that when that word is spoken or that murder takes place or this accident, as we call them, or whatever it may be, you don't see the events as much as you see the heart of your Father behind it. So here's a neighbor that God puts in my path. Maybe the nicest neighbor you could ever have or the ugliest and the meanest one. But don't just see them and don't just say, well, God's in control of this. No, but you see the heart of your father with his face shining in love to you Above it, on each side, below, behind, and in front. You see your Father. You see Him. That's faith. Faith concerning the providence of God. This destroys certain lies that man have created to deny the existence of God, the Creator, and the providential sustainer. 
This denies chance, luck, so that things happen by an uncontrollable happenstance without anybody's control. This destroys the thought of fate. Things occur blindly. They've been determined somehow, some way, but the determination is meaningless, and it just, you got to deal with it. This also, here we have to be careful, this truth of God's providential control and guidance of all things does not deny the responsibility on the part of every angel or man, every rational moral creature. Responsibility is not destroyed by God's control of them and use of them. Because responsibility is determined not by what God planned or by God's control. Responsibility is always and only determined by what God commanded that rational moral creature to do. And when that rational moral creature doesn't do what God commands it to do, it stands responsible to him. Human responsibility is determined only by God's commandments. So, Cyrus, Pharaoh, the persons that you live with, they can never say, I can't help it, nor can you. But all of us are called to exercise our wills to be obedient to Him and to Him alone. But when it takes place and it happens, then in our life, each one of us has to say, God will hold them responsible, but I'm responsible for how I respond to the heart of my Father that was controlling those words, that illness, that cross, whatever it may be. So now, how do we respond? Catechism says in question and answer 28, the first thing is this. It uses the word patient. In adversity. There's four things we want to deal with in this second point about how we are to respond. But the first is patient in adversity. Remember that the word patient we often use as, okay, you got to sit down and wait. That's not the way the Bible uses the word patience. There is one, there's a, there's a Greek word for that idea but that's not what is meant here with patient and adversity. Just as you have a noun, faith, and the verb for faith is believe, so when you have patience, the noun, the verb is endure. And what it means is this. that you open your arms calmly, joyfully and cheerfully. You open your arms and you embrace Him. Him. Every adversity is given by God to teach us to embrace Him. Adversity is shouting, look at me, look at me, look at me.
to work patience. Romans 5 verse 3, James 1 verse 3. God, to work patience in us. What does it mean to work patience? To develop patience. To make us learn what it is to endure sin's tribulations. Tribulation worketh patience. Patient experience. God works patience in us by saying to us through all of the tribulations, look at me and embrace me. Your ability calmly to endure to persevere in the midst of the trials so that you don't swerve from your embracing me. Maybe another way to put it is this way. Patience is so to see the heart of your Father that that when He sends these adversities, these difficult crosses, these hard times, hard to our flesh, we will not steer ourselves blind at the adversity, but we will f- strive with everything we have by exercising the muscle of faith to look up and behold that heart so that we never stop rendering grateful returns of ardent love. To him who loves us first, always. So we never stop saying, I love you too. I love you too. I love you too. I love you too. Never stop saying that. That's what patience in adversity is. The exercise of our faith in the relationship that God has established with us. Sure, that's the real meaning of the word covenant. Covenant is His relationship with you and your relationship in return to Him. Patient. This is His love. I realize that He knows what He's doing even in the pain of our life. He knows our ways. He knows our weariness. He understands the wrongs that we have to bear and endure. He wants us to see His heart. Why did the children of Israel have to be in Egypt for 400 years? This country's not even 300 years old. Israel was 400 years in Egypt. Why did Joseph have to go to prison? Why couldn't God just have brought him to Pharaoh's side? Why did he have to go to prison? We see things and we're going to judge them as being pointless and useless and unprofitable and unnecessary. That's because we're using our big minds to try to judge and evaluate how important things are. And then we look up. Well, my mind isn't very big after all. Pretty tiny. Real tiny. So tiny, I don't know what's best. So if I make a shot or miss it, he knows what's best. If I get hit by a truck, he knows what's best. All the minutes that we feel our heartbeat in a wound or pain. If we can be patient in adversity, but then to be thankful in prosperity. It's the observation of many who have had all kinds of experiences with God's people that we have a harder time being thankful in prosperity than patient 
in adversity. Because the adversity is a way of calling our attention. When we're experiencing all kinds of prosperity, we're enjoying it. And our minds aren't on him, the giver. Oh, yes, once in a while. But generally, to live each and every second conscious of the giver and the heart behind the giver, heart behind the gift, that's harder. When we're anticipating a problem, we can pray. But after the problem's gone, do we say thanks? This is why in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and then this, and forget not all his benefits. So that you're not just, I didn't just forget the delicious meal I had for breakfast. I forgot all of them. I forgot about all the good things that God has given in my life. And just because I said thanks for them once, He doesn't deserve thanks yet. And still, forget not all his benefits. We take prosperity for granted. But gratitude, thankfulness, sees that everything we did, every 20, part of the 25 years, 60 years, 80 years, whatever. You look at it. And you bow. Tonight for discussion groups, we're going to talk about worship. Worship isn't just this. Church. Worship is an attitude of heart every hour and every second of every hour of your whole life. Worship is your standing in awe and declaring the worthiness of your Heavenly Father to receive your thanks. So that we shut our mouths in complaint and we open them wide. So that as we sing, and we realize that His glory, our praises, excels. But I'm not going to stop praising Him. because I, Just because I can't get up to where He deserves, and just because I don't do it my best, or because my best is still not good enough to be there where it ought to be, that doesn't shut us. But we keep thinking, and He still loves me, and He's still forgiven me, he is worthy, so worthy, patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and then when it comes to the things that we anticipate or, or fear to happen, we're going to trust Him. We place firm trust in all things that may hereafter befall us. Whatever is in our path. Now, part of there is that this brain that we've got is very capable of anticipating all kinds of things that never happen. But even though all the kinds of things never happened, it never makes an optimist of us. It never makes us confident in his providential control. Even though so many things we worried about, crops going to fail how many times? And yet you get 50 bushels. And that's just a tiny example of all the different things where we start worrying as we lie in bed, losing sleep, because our mind is anticipating something that 
often doesn't happen. And yet as folly as that may be, to get a hold of the mind when we're half awake and half asleep lying in bed and not fully asleep, to say, I'm going to trust the heart behind the hand who not only has, but who is going to keep there. He's going to stay there. He's never going to stop being there. The conviction, the conviction that enabled you to be thankful and even embrace Him in the hardest times of the past assures you that He will give you the ability to embrace Him in the future so that you can trust that His love, which has been from everlasting, is going to be there every second of the rest of your life. That's why they word it the way they did, our fathers. Nothing is going to separate you from His love. You're looking at this thing that you conceive of and it's keeping you from falling asleep. And you're worried about, or you dream about this, this wedding or, or all these other issues that we can conceive of. And, and he says, I love you, child. I've brought you. I'll keep you. Trust is a bowing to his will and believing that Father does know what's best. Trust is calm and peace. You may hear winds coming, but your anchor holds. Because you know who holds you. Patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, trusting Him with the future. But always, always obeying Him. Now remember, don't think this, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. No. Obey Him means you love Him. On these two hang all. You love Him. You, you obey Him by loving Him. So that then you're, re, you're fully aware His his providential control over all things never removes my responsibility out of love to strive to do whatever would please and honor Him. And that's what He commands me to do. So His, his providential guidance of all things does not contradict nor violate any one of His commandments, and specifically the commandment that I love Him. Lay yourself upon the altar of willing service to Him. Now, of all the people in the world, we are best equipped to do that. To lay ourselves upon the altar. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? How can I serve thee? I want to serve Him by serving and assisting all those that He puts in my path. Okay, and I have every confidence he's going to work it out. You know what? He's even going to use all the sins that I commit and all the sins others commit against me. He is going to work it out. You just serve and assist him because you know his heart toward you. Amen.
All those who with heart confiding depend on Thee alone are like the mount on which Zion is built. Because we know what will never change, but cannot ever change. Thy heart toward thy adopted children. We honor and thank thee, Father. And all we can say ever again is thanks for the truth. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.